please forgive me if I stumble or stammer. It's just because I'm surrounded by an audience of intelligent people and I myself am not intelligent. So I find myself at a distinct disadvantage. Um, I'm going to try to take you through some work that I've done in digital advertising and show the effect of digital advertising on the industry, um, particularly as things have evolved and more functionality has become available and different things are possible through technology and there's more people walking around with smartphones in their pocket and you can use all of those things to make incredible assets and help a brand. So. Um, I was going to try to advance the slides with, uh, there's a new phone app, you know, not that new that allows you to advance the slides and I can't figure out how to use it and I'm supposed to be here like teaching you about digital so that should just let you know what you're dealing with right away. Uh, my my uh, wife, Rachel, is going to advance the slides. She believes that this is beneath her. Um, so I'll be hearing about this shit later from her. Um, so hello, uh, my name is Dave Schiff. And uh, the next slide, I've spent my entire career in, in advertising. I worked at Crispin Porter and Bogusky for about 10 years. I was an executive creative director there. I got to work on most of the big brands that ever came through that shop. And then three years ago, um, myself and two of the top people there, uh, we held hands and we jumped off the world's steepest financial cliff and started our own agency out of a coffee shop in Boulder, Colorado with no clients, no funding, no clue how to run a business. And uh, it was interesting because the first client call we got, um, we would sit inside the coffee shop. I don't mean this was our office. We just went into a coffee shop and worked out of that. That was the office. And the first call we got, they said, hey, let's come down to your office and we'll meet you. And we said, yeah, man, let's just do a coffee shop. It'll be more chill, you know, it'll be because there was no office. So uh, from that time, uh, it's, that was three years ago. I didn't sleep for like two years. Um, now we have uh, 35 people and some national business. And, you know, um, you'll see that's not what this presentation is about. But, you know, over the past 13 years, um, the way that we've applied, uh, you know, digital technology to advertising has changed and the role of digital advertising has changed and you'll see how we were just sort of finding our way early on, you know, what are we going to do with this? And then you'll see how, um, you know, the, the things you can do with it uh, evolved greatly over time. So, um, the first thing that happened, I just want to talk about some of the big changes that have happened to advertising really before digital uh, emerged. And one was the fragmentation of media. I never really understand phrases like this. All this means is there used to be three channels on TV in America. I don't know how many channels there were here, but we didn't have cable. There weren't 200 channels. There weren't shows just for women and shows just for men necessarily, not as many or entire networks. Um, so you could make one TV commercial and you could reach everybody. Um, that time is over. Now you have such fragmentation that uh, you have a difficult time. If you make a television commercial, it's still very expensive, and then you're only reaching a very small audience most of the time, unless you're buying across shows and all this other stuff. So it became very hard to spend money and reach everyone in, in one shot. So that was a big change to advertising. Um, another one is what I like to call conversation instead of announcement. It used to be that a brand would treat you as though they were announcing something to you. And a lot of the time that happened through a commercial. So they would just give you a message, but they would never expect anything back. They wouldn't listen to you. They wouldn't see how it was accepted in pop culture and then react to that. We started to see even before the emergence of digital technology, this back and forth between uh, the consumer and the company and it started to feel more like a peer-to-peer -peer relationship instead of I'm on high giving you the message from Coke or Microsoft or whoever else. So that was a big change in advertising and that's still something that's happening now is you're talking back and forth through the ads um, less than you are messaging simply to people. Um, and then the final thing and this I think is a fantastic ad is the uh, 
two bytes are better than one. I think that's from like 1978. Who knows what that is? But the emergence of digital and social. And so, you know, this was an, uh, partially a solution to those other things. You know, you had this fragmentation of the, of the uh, media landscape. Now you have this incredible new tool where you can target people specifically and you can reach a wide audience without spending a lot of money. Um, and, uh, you know, so what I want to do to show you how uh, digital has evolved over my time in the industry is start actually with something that's not digital at all, with a TV commercial. Because I, want, I believe that uh, you know, the following commercials that we're going to show you really pushed the envelope in television. You, we were doing as much as you could do in TV and pushing as far as you can do and being as non-traditional um, as you can be in television. Is that uh, lighter? Can that get lighter? Mm. See, so you already yes. fucked up. <laughs> so so um, the, uh, the lawyers campaign we did for Coke Zero, I don't know if you guys remember, but Coke Zero didn't exist until 2004, and I got to launch it at the agency I was at. And it was a very simple strategy. It's supposed to taste more like Coca-Cola. That's it. That's all they wanted to say. And if you've had Diet Coke, um, Coke Zero is much sweeter, and it does taste a lot more like Coca-Cola. So if you think about the kind of advertising you see from the Coca-Cola company, it's usually happy and it's animated and it's creatures and, and a wonderland and fantasy and kids having a good time. It feels very much like advertising feels. It's not very honest. You know, if you, if you think about what the Coca-Cola company really is, is it's a giant profit-driven corporation that's trying to make the most money possible at all times. That's not what you're seeing in the advertising, right? So what we said was we tried to make something very disruptive. We said, okay, we can make a commercial like that about how cool it is when things are the same and it's wonderful. Or we said, what would really happen? What would really happen if Coke Zero tasted almost exactly like Coke? Well, first of all, it would start stealing sales of Coke. It would cannibalize the sales, and Coke wouldn't sell as well because more of their customers would be buying Coke Zero. And probably within the Coca-Cola company, the Coke people would get pissed off at the Coke Zero people. They would be mad at them, and there would be infighting. And so we made this commercial about that. We made a series of them, and it was very difficult to sell this commercial to the Coca-Cola company because they want to do everything about happiness. But we said, if you really want to make people think these are the same, do this campaign. So we hired two actors. And because there's 4,000 people in Atlanta, Georgia that work at Coke, not everyone knows everyone. So we got them fake badges and credentials and even telephone extensions and business cards. And if you called them, that's who you got. There were, so they seemed like real people. And we pretended that they were, they were with the Coca-Cola part of the company. And then there's about 100 lawyers that work inside of Coke. And we brought those lawyers in, and we put hidden cameras in this conference room. And these actors asked these lawyers that work at Coke, can we sue the Coke Zero team? Um, which is, of course, the same company. And these commercials that you're going to see are real attorneys on hidden camera being asked to help to sue their own company. So uh, we made three of these, and these should play now. We represent the Coke brand. We would like to sue Coca-Cola Zero. Would you say that we have a case? For what? For taste infringement. We want to just sue them back to the Stone Age to send a message that they're tampering with really the flagship of the company. It's one company. It's like you suing yourself. Yeah, but they're on a different part of our floor. Da, 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 da. So that was the first one, and then I'll show you two more. Uh, again, another real lawyer being asked to help sue Coca-Cola. We represent the Coke brand, and we would love to somehow bring some kind of legal action against Coke Zero. There might be some taste infringement issues. Oh, so you're worried about? I think it's basic taste infringement. I'd like to stick with that phrase, because that it's sounds not, really good to me. It's not a claim. It's not a claim. Could we sue them just to get it? In the court to to just just humiliate be these people. It'll be, you'll be humiliated and you'll we'll be, be humiliated and, and you'll get fired. I don't want that. Da, 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 da. And this last one. Would you agree that these two products taste similar? Yes. 
Do you think that we, as the Coke brand, would have a case against the Coke Zero brand? Because they've infringed upon our taste. It's a novel theory. What would your proposed endgame be? What would, what would your... If they were crushed and Ron, their director, was in the fetal position crying under the copier. Crying. Da, 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 da. So this was a really unusual way to show in television uh, how these two products are similar. You're showing these people fighting, they're trying to sue each other. Um, no one expected this from the Coca-Cola company and this product was expected to fail miserably. Uh, and instead we had double digit growth every quarter for seven years straight. And so, um, and we also had many people write in and say, I feel like you were honest with me. And that's what made it work is Coke said, hey look, we're a big company too, we have politics too, we get in arguments too, and it made you feel more like there was a connection between you and Coca-Cola that there never has been before. And, and so, you know, it was a successful campaign. But, but the reason I show it to you is because as unusual as it was, and we ended up making 14 spots, we did a Super Bowl commercial, it was a fantastic campaign, um, it was still just, messaging in the end and entertainment. It's passive. We're showing you something and hoping that you have a reaction, but there's no way for you to interact with the ad. And that's the essence of TV. You can reach a lot of people, but you don't have this interactivity. And so when we first started working on uh, digital things, um, we said, hey, let's look at this ability for you to interact with the content and do amazing things. And just that by itself seemed like an amazing deal, a big deal. Um, so I'm going to show you a few of the things we made very early on and we thought they were very sophisticated and, and uh, you'll see uh, the first one is um, it's called Facial Profiler and what we did was in the same way that we had an unusual way to talk about similarity with the lawyers commercial where they they fight over the similarity in this one have you, ever, have you ever seen a person that looks sort of like someone you know, you know, almost exactly like someone you know? It's a weird thing, right? And so we said, what if there must be another you walking around out there, like another person that looks like you? What if you could find that person? Wouldn't that be weird? And so we created the first Facebook app, really the first app that used facial recognition uh, um, technology. And so what this thing would do is it would search Facebook for other people that look like you and then return these results. And I'll, we'll play this video about the project, but this was another, this was a, the difference here is now you have something digital and it's not just something I watch on TV. It's something I can play with, I can interact with it. And again, this is early on, we, you know, we made this uh, in the early 2000s, but um, this was called Facial Profiler. Since childhood, we've been taught to believe that we're unique, so the idea that we may not be is universally fascinating. Coke Zero Facial Profiler tapped into this cultural tension through the actual product, celebrating Coke Zero's uncanny resemblance to Coke and giving users a chance to find someone with an uncanny resemblance to them. Facial Profiler enables users to perform searches using state-of-the-art facial recognition software for free on Facebook. More than a search tool, Facial Profiler is the world's first social community exclusively based on appearance. Giving new meaning to the face in Facebook by adding an exclusive layer of connectivity to the world's largest online networking site. <laughs> Never before have users been able to seek out strangers who happen to share their face and connect with them in their social circle. Facial Profiler grows smarter through a combination of machine scoring and user ratings. And as the face database grows, so does match accuracy. Even after the user has left the experience, the app continues to search for increasingly accurate matches to automatically send the user. Every match celebrating the similarity between Coke and Coke Zero. Is there someone out there that looks like me? 
It's a question that's proven irresistible the world over. Facial profiler finally provides the answer. So that thing was really weird, you know, and a lot of people used it. And it was, it was interesting because um, it comes at that idea of similarity from almost like a scary, like a creepy, but there's a curiosity. You can't help but look. And I remember when we were making it, you had to opt in. You know, we couldn't just automatically use all your pictures. It would comb all your Facebook pictures and then look for other people that look like you. But in the beginning, the matches were terrible. And then as soon as we got to 30,000 people, they started getting scary, how close they looked. And then I realized there's only about 30,000 different kinds of people in the world, and we're all just like a factory part number. And so I got very depressed. But the, this campaign did very well. Um, and in just one year, you know, we had all of those matches. And that was a lot of experience to go through. You know, you had to upload your face, and you had to opt into the community. So it was amazing that we got that much traction. Um, but you can see where the strategy was similar and I think no matter what you're doing in this industry you always need a strategy and it's a very simple one for zero similarity so you can think of all kinds of crazy ideas about similarity uh, whether they're going to sue their own company or whether they're going to find people that look alike and say hey it's hard to tell this person from this person it's hard to tell coke from coke zero but you know what you see with that is wow I can play with this I can use this it's entertaining I can it's different than a TV commercial even than a crazy TV commercial like the ones we made before so we started to realize wow this is a whole new world that we can do with technology and so we started finding these unique entertaining experiences and we tried to base them on um, human insights the human insight for facial profiler was just there are people that look like other people and it's weird. You know, I bet people would be interested in that. This next one was strictly a game that we made. And I'm showing you these because they're early ideas, you know, and we thought they were so advanced when we made them, you know, and, and they're kind of a joke compared to what we can do today. But this next one was a game. And I don't know if this happens in Istanbul, but if you're drinking a coffee or a drink and you go to get in your car, I don't know if you ever put the drink on the roof and then you get in the car and then you drive away with the drink on the roof. So um, we, uh, Coke was a sponsor of a racing team and we used this insight to create a game called Rooftop Racer. So we'll show you that right now. <clears throat> So that's a game, you know, and, and if you're going to make a game for a brand, you have to make it about the product still. You can't just make a fun game that has nothing to do with the product. So we realized that human insight. People forget that they leave their drink up there. So you had to balance it the whole time. And that was part of the game. And it was all about the Coke Zero. So again, you're, we're, we're entertaining people. If you look at these ideas, you know, the Facebook idea, it's fun to play with. This thing, fun to play with. We're trying to make it about the product, you know, but really, what we're essentially doing is giving people an opportunity to have fun, a little bit more fun than a TV commercial. And then this last thing we made, do you guys, did, did you see Tron, the movie here? Did they have the movie Tron? So anyone that knows the movie Tron, by the way, all you people that are nodding, you're totally dorky science fiction fans. And, but I respect that because uh, I'm one too. But when, when uh, a car in Tron, a, a motorcycle drives, 
it leaves a wall of light behind it and they use it to box each other in. Um, and so we created a game using uh, uh, smartphone technology and, and uh, the fact that it's geo aware and you could create your own light wall when you walked around the world. So you'll see uh, Coca-Cola had, you know, they often sponsor movies and they came to us. And typically what you do in advertising is if you're helping to promote a movie, you make a poster or you put it on the side of a cup or you make, you know, things that go in stores. We said, hey, let's make an app that's never been done before where you can actually play the game like the cars. So this, this video will show you how that works. Coke Zero took Coke's iconic taste and updated it with zero calories. So to promote Tron Legacy, Coke Zero took Tron's iconic life cycle game and updated it with Coke Zero Life Cycle. Life Cycle is the first location-based Tron video game. Using a phone's accelerometer, compass, and GPS capabilities, Life Cycle turned walking into a game by translating the player's real-time movements into in-game action. Players walk or run around in the real world to create Tron light walls. It can then use these light walls to box in opponents. Players can battle artificially intelligent bots or join live multiplayer games against people in other cities. Live Cycle was built to be inherently social. Players can invite Facebook friends to battles and every battle won and badge unlocked is posted to their wall. And with no major paid media, Live Cycle relied on fans, blogs, and online magazines to spread the word. Instead of just creating the usual movie posters or promotional movie cups, Coke Zero created Live Cycle, a mobile game that not only gave fans a new way to interact with Tron, but a new way to interact with Coke Zero as well. Thanks for watching. So the funny thing about that game is people would be walking around with their phones and then they would just start like running through the bushes and they looked like insane people. Um, and it was all based on the fact that they were playing this game. And you could play against people in other countries so they didn't have to be right there. So you would be running around and then someone's running around in, in Belgrade and they don't know why <laughs> either person is running. So it was a very innovative thing. It had never been done before up to that time. It's sort of like a real life video game that you get to play. But again, like we thought these ideas were so great when we first made them, but they, if you think about what they're doing, they are advertising a brand and they are entertaining you, and, and, but that's all. They're not really giving you the ability to accomplish anything or making your life easier or adding any kind of utility. Um, and so, you know, they were pleasant distractions, they were fun, and that was more than a TV commercial had ever done before, but there's so much more that digital can do. There's so much more you can do with all the technology that's out there. So we realized that, um, we're, I want you to stop here. <laughs> just want you guys to enjoy this slide. Okay. Um, instead of just giving people things to play with, you know, uh, uh, giving them things to play with, what if we gave them things that were useful, you know, things that actually allowed them to do things and made their life uh, easier? And so I call these, I made this term up, so I, I certainly wouldn't write it down, um, but it's, uh, you know, the idea of utility, but functional utility. So I'm going to make someone's life easier through digital on behalf of a brand. And that felt like the next step. Don't just entertain them. That's not our job. What if we can make life easier for them as well? So I'm going to show you something that was really one of the first things we did like this, and it's called Pizza Hero. And so with Pizza Hero, you'll see it's a game where you use an iPad to make a pizza, just like you would at uh, Domino's. But at the end of the game, you can actually hit a button and order that pizza. It will send an order to the store, and the pizza you created in the game will actually be delivered. So you can see we're making it do something now. We're making it have a transaction, which is good for the business, and we're making it order a pizza, which is good for the person. <clears throat>
Romulus Pizza. So as you can imagine, there was like a bunch of 15 year old kids that had like the high score on all this. They were like amazing because they would play it for like 14 hours at a time. And Domino's actually sent them all offers, job offers, like you're so good at making pizzas, do you want to come and work in the restaurant? And of course, most of them were like, fuck that, I don't want to work in a Domino's. <laughs> you know, so it didn't work so great as a recruitment technique, but um, it, was, uh, it was an excellent way to add functionality to now we started to think, hey, you know, this is a whole nother thing. This, you know, what started out as pure advertising is now, hey, helping people get through, you know, through experiences and help helping them with life. That becomes what advertising is. And so um, the, the next thing we made was Pizza Tracker. And this was a really simple thing. We visited Domino's and we realized that they had all of this data. And data, man, you can think of so many cool things to do if you go to a company and you figure out all the information they have. So they had a system and they knew when the pizza was being made that you ordered, when the pizza was going in the oven, when the pizza was going into the delivery car, and then how far it was away from your house. So we actually, on their website, just created this simple tool using data they already had, but we made it consumer facing. And so now if you went online and you did an order, you could see, order placed, order being prepared, order baked in the oven, now it's going in the box, now it's being delivered. And you could watch that progress bar, which was this really cool level of transparency. And then also at the end, you could rate your Domino's experience. So if the Domino's pizza you got wasn't any good, you could tell them, hey, you know, it was cold or it showed up and I didn't like it. So now you have this great functionality where you're informing people of you know where they are in this process and they're waiting and at the same time you're creating this back and forth where you have a rating system and it helped op uh, Domino's optimize what was happening in the stores you know so again this is becoming much more than advertising and that was exciting um, and then the last thing I'll show you is something very interesting that we did a few years ago do you guys have Best Buy here? Do you know what Best Buy is? It's a it's a electronic store. They sell TVs and all that stuff, right? So they have the guys in the blue shirts that walk all around the store, and they're supposed to be experts, you know, and they're supposed to help you. So we wanted to create something that would highlight the expertise of the people that work there. Um, so we made this thing called 12 Force, which is what it was is any employee, hundreds, thousands of, of Best Buy employees signed up to be a part of 12 Force. Then, as a user, if you just tweeted at these guys and said, hey, what's the best, um, what's the best DVD player for under $400? That message would go to every, almost every um, uh, Best Buy employee, even the ones that weren't working. They could be off, their day off. And then if they decided they wanted to answer, they would say, oh, you gotta get this one, this is the best one. And so you had all of this information from all of these Best Buy employees that you could access at any time just by tweeting at them. And, and nothing like that had ever been done before. So we created this. I think this is one of the more boring videos, so please forgive me. <clears throat> but it's a, it's a smart product. <clears throat> Best Buy has always been the undisputed tech expert, but their key asset, the knowledge of the Blue Shirts and Geek Squad agents, was confined to their stores. So if people never came in, how would they ever know what they were missing? So Best Buy decided to launch a tool that could extend the knowledge of their geeks and Blue Shirts beyond their walls and out into the digital space. Meet the 12 Force, a modern, digitized, volunteer army of Best Buy employees available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, on Twitter. And not to push products or increase sales, but to provide 12, a fancy new term for expert technical help in tweet form. If you have a question, simply tweet at 12force and get an answer fast. In fact, for every question tweeted, over 2,000 blue shirts are racing to give the fastest and bestest answer. And you've got answers from real Best Buy employees not from some call center in Ocean Away. And no questions are out of bounds. No questions are too ridiculous. No questions are ignored. Plus, the collective power of 12 Force is always watching for tech issue tweets and can quickly lend a hand, even without anyone asking. Since the launch, 12 Force has answered thousands and thousands of tweets. Landed Best Buy in the top 25 social brands of 2009, and helped drive overall customer complaints down by nearly 20% in the first year alone. 
But most importantly, 12 Force paved the way for a whole new approach to customer service. Thanks for watching. So it wasn't as boring as I remember because I don't know if you saw the one question there, but it was like, what kind of batteries are best for a vibrator? I thought that was an interesting question and I believe the answer was an alkaline battery. Anyway, um, that was another way of making people's lives easier. So again, now we're playing with these ideas that help people get things done. It's, it's doing things, it's not just saying things. And, and so um, the last thing we'll show you in this, do you guys have Fridays here, TGI Fridays? Okay, so they had this, um, it's a restaurant, and they had this promotion called Endless Appetizers. So if you ordered like uh, mozzarella sticks or wings or one of their appetizers, you could just eat them for $10 until you can't eat anymore. And so um, they created this and then uh, um, they were trying to kind of figure out a way to get out of it, you know, and so because they were losing a lot of money. So if you go to the next, uh, I'll show you some, some ads we made. And we did something similar with transparency that we did with Coke Zero. So here we are, we're making these Facebook posts talking about, that's a cheese stick in the shape of infinity, talking about, hey, it's awesome. You can eat as many appetizers as you want. And then this next one sort of did the same thing. It's like a nebula, you know, eternity, but it has a, a potato skin. I don't even know if you guys have those, but they're not that good. But uh, uh, it has a potato skin here. And then the same time that's happening. So they're telling the world and they're advertising, it's great, come here, eat as much as you can. It's infinite apps. Um, what we're doing, on, we opened up uh, um, Twitter accounts for all of their executives, their head attorney, the CEO, um, the, the chief marketing officer, and the attorney, you know, this is fake, we made this, but it looks real. And she's saying on Twitter to the CMO, um, look, we got a problem, we can't end this, we can't end this promotion because it says endless, but then it says offer ends right here. So we may have a little bit of a legal problem. And then he says, well, come on, I mean, it's just, it's just advertising. Am I supposed to sue Red Bull because I don't have any wings? Like, come on, we're just, it's, it's. So they go back and forth and she says, actually, deceptive advertising is illegal. She sends him this book. So they're having this whole argument on Twitter the whole time they're saying, Endless Apps is great, Endless Apps is great. You know, on Twitter, they're freaking out. Like, what are we gonna do about this? And it was all, of course, planned so that people could enjoy it. And, and then finally, the idea was, well, let's put it off on people. You know, we'll just, we'll just like make a thing and, and people can control it and then it'll go away. And, and so what we did was we created this clock. So it was supposed to end, the offer was supposed to end at midnight on this certain day, but we said every time, every time someone retweets this tweet, we'll add 10 minutes and back to the promotion. And like, it never went down below 10 minutes. I mean, it just kept going and going and going and going. And that created a whole new problem, which is like, now how do we end it? How do we end it? But it was fun because um, it gave people the opportunity to control, uh, always in the fast food industry, it's called a limited time offer, LTO. But you never get to control that. They end it when they end it. Well, this actually gave people the opportunity to keep extending it and keep extending it. So again, you know, um, giving something to people that actually they can do something and they can make their life better. So this is now representing this evolution, these last group of ideas that we've seen where I'm able to do something, not just watch something or play with something. Um, and then I think the final idea we will show in this is a thing called Whopper Sacrifice. You probably never saw this because it immediately got banned by Facebook. Um, what it was is it was the anniversary of the Whopper, the sandwich at Burger King, and we were trying to teach everybody, we were trying to prove that people love the Whopper. So we created a way, you know how you have a lot of friends? on Facebook, and you're probably not friends with half of them, <laughs> you don't know who they are. Well, this was a way to unfriend people, and you'll see in the video how, what it has to do with the Whopper, but. Burger King knew that America loved the Whopper, but wanted to prove it. So it turned to Facebook and put the love to the test. Everybody loves adding friends, but is that simply because it's fun to see your friendless pile up? Well, what if there was a way to dump friends and get rewarded for it? And what if this turned into a race to dump them before they dumped you? Meet Whopper Sacrifice. 
delete 10 friends, and receive a free water. A true moral dilemma, a telling choice. What do you love more, your friends or the water? A difficult question to answer, or was it? Almost instantly, people were sacrificing their friends for walkers like crazy, to the tune of 200,000 friends sacrificed in just over a week. And people's burning desire to dump friends for the water challenged the very concept of Facebook. Instead of embracing this new marketing opportunity and the 35 million free media impressions it received, Facebook began limiting its functionality, ultimately forcing Burger King to take it down. Walker's sacrifice had been sacrificed. But despite the application's short-lived activation, Burger King proved what it knew to be true, that Americans love the walk more than they like their friends. <laughs> Thanks for watching. So even though that seems like a failure, we launched it, we got tons of press, um, and then when they shut it down, we got even more press. It was better. Um, but you know, the idea there was to create a tool for people to unfriend because people had too many friends. If you had 800 friends and you only really liked 200 of them, you, you had a way to get rid of them and get a free Whopper in the process. Um, so uh, again, a, an interesting idea, but one that's all about utility, you know? And so now we're starting to, uh, we're starting to see these ideas and they did more than, than just make people's lives fun, like the, the driving game we showed or the game where you run around. Uh, uh, now, you know, um, we have something that's allowing people to get stuff done. Why are you going so sorry, fast? It's not cool. Look at me when you're right <laughs> <laughs> um, So, you know, it's interesting to consider that those are now ads. An ad is Whopper Sacrifice. It's not a magazine ad. It's not a TV ad. An ad is a game. An ad is a, a thing that allows you to order a pizza through your iPad. It's changing the definition of what an, advertise, an advertisement is. Um, and so, uh, you know, we wondered what's next. So now we're helping people with these functional things they can do. Sometimes they're fun, but it's really just helping them do things like order pizzas or unfriend people. And, and so what if we push things farther? Um, what if instead of just creating things that help people accomplish mechanical tasks, what if we did things that allowed them to express who they were? to live their values you know, through whatever it was we make, to badge themselves as whatever they are, someone who cares, someone who plays sports, still add functionality to their life and add uh, convenience, but do it in a way that is reflective of someone's soul and who they are and allow them to express that. And that felt like a really rich place. Now it's a whole different deal. Now I'm able to you know, express to my community and the larger community what I believe in, and I can act on my beliefs all through digital. Think how far we've come from a TV commercial that just makes someone laugh. And now all of a sudden, I can care about things, be who I am, and do it all through a brand. And, and so um, we call that cultural utility, at least I do. So if the first thing was functional, I'm not sure why Beyonce is up there, by the way, I have no idea. We have a crazy designer that made this deck for me, and, so I'll have a talk with him when I get back. Unless you guys like this, then I'll tell him good job. Um, but these ideas are really about cultural utility, about, about expressing your beliefs and your values through a brand and through uh, some asset that we make digitally. So um, I'm going to show you this video. Um, there was a tiny motorcycle company in, in Oregon called Bramo, and they made the first ever electric motorcycle that was allowed on the highway. All the other ones before that, they went too slow, but this one can go on the big highways because it can go like 80 miles an hour, you know? So, but they had no money and they weren't getting any funding from the government. You know, Tesla and all the fancy electric cars were getting all this funding and these guys were just this tiny little company and they weren't getting any funding. So they said, how can you make us famous overnight with no money? And it's like a dream assignment, right? <laughs> right? So, um, but we liked the brand and we wanted to help. So um, we created this thing and I'm not even sure what to call it still today. It doesn't fit into a category. It's not an app. It's not a digital utility. It's not a plug-in. It's not, I don't know what to call it. But what it was is, is and I don't know if you guys remember this, but in 2008, um, Ford, Chevrolet, you know, General Motors, and Chrysler all of those companies were going bankrupt. And so the heads of the companies went to Washington to ask President Obama for a handout, for free money to get going again. 
but they flew there to the meeting in, in private planes. And it was like, you know, I don't know, $20,000 per person. So when they landed, he said, how did you get here? And they said, well, we all flew on private planes. And he said, maybe you should look at the way you're doing business before you come and ask me for money. And so people were mad in, in America about this, you know, because we were ashamed of our auto industry and they were so wasteful. So what we did was we said, let's make this motorcycle famous. What it does is it plugs into an electrical outlet. That's how it, that's how it works. And you can make it about 100 miles. So we said, let's do their same journey from Detroit to Washington. And we're going to go from plug to plug. We're going to sleep on people's couches. We're going to do whatever we got to do. And then when we get to Washington, we're going to try to give these motorcycles to the president instead of asking for something. And it costs about $4 in electricity to get these to. So we filmed it. Apologies, I'm the quote unquote talent in it because we couldn't afford to hire an actor. And the other guy is an engineer at the company. But um, we made this this whole effort, this live advertising, digitally enabled uh, you know, website that, that people could participate in. Again, I have a hard time describing it, but I think it'll make sense after you watch the video. I'm talking to Ryan Wisman and David Schiff. They're right now traveling on a brand new electric motorcycle from Detroit to Washington, D.C. Their mission is to shock Barack Obama. Now, I don't know what exactly that means, so why don't you tell people? Well, uh we wanted to retrace the journey taken by the big three automotive CEOs in 2008 when they flew from Detroit, Michigan to Washington, D.C. to ask uh, the government for billions of dollars in bailout funds. Only we are going to get there on electric motorcycles at a cost of about $4 per guy. And when we arrive, instead of asking for a handout, we just want to give something to the president. Grandma was a small company with a big idea, the Inertia, the world's first highway legal 100% electric production motorcycle, made right here in America. Our trip will be an organic, real-time, interactive experiment at 70 miles per hour through the blue highways of small town America, designed to accomplish three goals. Make Bramo famous without any advertising or media budget. Position Bramo as a leader in the fight for additional governmental funding of electric vehicles and empower everyday Americans to effect political change to the Bramble brand. The home of the project was ShockingBarack.com. It became home to an on-the-go form of crowdsourcing. It served as a makeshift social community, and it was a recruitment tool for outlets, couches, and political context. As the ride unfolded, it became evident that it was more than a road trip. It was a new form of live advertising, one that enabled content to be created, produced, edited and published in real time, so the world could not only watch, it could participate. People began to feel less like they were following the trip, more like they were along for the ride. And as the miles went by, the project was fueled as much by altruism as by electricity. I got power for you there. Hey, Mark with the Harry. He's noticing uh, a pretty amazing rig here. What have you got? All the electricity. We do. We do. Can we do it? Sure. Before long, the process was feeding itself as a passive audience transformed into an active community, one that influenced, encouraged, and guided our actions. Strangers from other states, and even other countries, helped us locate outlets, food, and shelter along the way. Step closer to realizing the goal. 
We're in the White House. Kind of has a little bit of a gated community vibe. You guys this guy's number? You know, with their office of climate and change to give a ball right now? Calls were returned. Doors began to open. The policymakers began to listen. Distinguished senators and congressmen, you guys have juice. And it's the kind of juice that we can't get from an electrical outlet. I'm hoping that somewhere, someone is trying this hard to give me something. And then it happened. The public support, media buzz, and mounting social pressure caught the attention of the man who oversees the nation's energy policy. Greg just came out of the meeting and with uh, Secretary Chu and Obama and asked for a million vehicles by 2015. And, you know, we're kind of signing up for 150,000 of so Hopefully this will further pave the way for uh, when these bikes actually go to Obama, although the bigger mission is definitely being accomplished. So we've come a long way, both in terms of mileage and in terms of getting a bike to Barack Obama. But if we're honest, we haven't done what we came here to do, and that's give the president an electric motorcycle. Brian is chaining this bike to a pole somewhere in uh, downtown Washington. We're going to take the key to that lock, and we're also going to take the ignition key. We're dropping these in an envelope. These are going to Barack Obama. It's not the fairy tale ending that we had hoped for, but it's a real ending, and I think that's maybe even better. So, I... I think that those motorcycles would have been taken apart and stolen in about 20 minutes because Washington, D.C. is a pretty rough town. But what happened was right after we locked him up, uh, Stephen Chu, the Secretary of Energy, they have a museum in the bottom of the Department of Energy. And so they asked us if they could uh, you know, display the bikes. And, but what it did for people was it was a way to express your values. If you believe in sustainability, if you believe in uh, alternative fuel vehicles, if you believe in a lot of the things that they represented, you could get on this website and you could con we had a tool where you could contact your senator or your, and, and say that you wanted this. You could sign physically using the trackpad and then we would take that signature and sign it right on the motorcycles, you know, so you could do that. You could tell us where to go. We had a guy from, God, I can't remember where he was from. Uh, we were in the middle of Ohio and our hands were cold and a guy was following the, the trip and I think the guy was, I think he was in uh, uh, France somewhere and he said, oh, I just called the, the store at the next street up and they have uh, hand warmers you can put in your gloves, you should pull off there. It was crazy, you know? And so it uh, really brought everyone together and it allowed you to, to sort of badge yourself and express yourself. And it was in a way, it was sort of a form of sped up democracy because um, we never would have gotten a meeting with the Secretary of Energy, but because everyone piled on and it got all of this press, they had to meet with this guy. And in the end, they got funding. Bramo got like a $50 million uh, tranche of funding, and now the, the um, company is doing really well. But that was, we didn't even know what to call that thing. Is it a website? Is it a political movement? Is it, a, it was all these different things, using all these different tools. So um, that started to feel very different than an ad. And at the end of the day, even though it, it was well-meaning, that's an ad for Bramo motorcycles, you know? And so it's amazing what an ad can do. Um, we created something called beer mode. You guys all have airplane mode on your phone. So um, we were approached by uh, a company called New Belgium Brewery. And uh, they said, hey, will you build us an app that shows everyone all the beers we make, you know, and you can see, learn all about them. And we said, well, who the fuck is going to, like, download that? Like, why do I want to go through your beers? you got to give people a reason to have that app, right? So we came up with this idea of beer mode, and it's a lot like airplane mode, which is when you put your phone in beer mode, you're out. It's turned off. No one can find you. But the entire time it's in beer mode, it's updating your social networks like crazy, like you're all over it. You know, you care, you're busy, you're doing all these things, and it's creating all these posts. And so really, the original, if you go back, this was the thing they want us, wanted us to build, and we built it. So we showed all their beers and all the alcohol content and did a cool design. But then when you go into beer mode, um, so now you're in beer mode on this screen, now you're asked to uh, select a personality. And it could be cerebral, so it would like, post all these crazy smart articles about different things. Or you could be industrious, 
So it would be, oh, I'm so busy. I got so many reports to do. I'm working my ass off. Or it could be concerned, you know, and you're concerned about the environment and animals and whatever. So this person has checked concerned. And then you set how much time you want it to go for. And then um, what it does is it generates these posts. So if you go to this, this was a real post that was generated by Beer Mode. So this guy, Dan Nelson, it says, for once, I have some positive polar bear news to share. Levels of toxic contaminants in cubs on Svalbard Island are down by almost 59%. And, and he doesn't know, he's not following this issue, he knows nothing about it. But then all these people are like, wow, I didn't know you were following this issue, great news. And then Dan replied, one step at a time. And then here, um, wow, very cool, Dan, word up. Um, for once, pretty sure this is the first piece of polar bear news you've ever shared. My point exactly. And all those are pre-written. So it seems like he's there, you know, engaging. And these just generated these huge strings of content on Facebook that were hilarious. And so, it, you know, it was fun, but it also uh, it kind of said something about who you were. You could position yourself as smart or as uh, caring. And really, it just said you were funny. And it gave you the chance to drink the beer. The way that it related back to the product was, what good is even the best beer if you don't have time to drink it? You're always getting you know, all these updates on your phone. Just shut your phone off and enjoy your beer. So um, that was an interesting thing that we just did. And they've just recently started promoting that app on the packaging. And I love when that happens. When you look at a piece of digital marketing and it works so well that they actually put it on the package um, and start, uh, start promoting it. And so there's just two more things I'll show you. This was something we did called Epic Mix, which is now you're getting into really sophisticated technology. And again, what Epic Mix did was allow me to live my life as a skier and badge myself as a skier. I don't know if you've heard of Vail Mountain. Vail Mountain's a big mountain in Colorado where people ski. Um, have you heard of Nike Plus, uh, uh, the running app? So Nike Plus, it tracks your running and it shows everyone what you're doing and you can share that with the world. So really what this is, is Nike Plus for the mountain. We created this app um, when I was still at Crispin Porter, the first agency, and, and there's a little RFID ticket. There's a, when you buy your lift ticket, so you don't even have to have a device. You get on the mountain, you have your ticket, and it's scanning the whole time, how many vertical feet you're skiing, all the runs you're taking, where you are, and so you'll see the way it works in this video. <clears throat> there have always been mountains. But it wasn't until someone came up with the idea to ride them that things really got interesting. Followed by the desire to build trails, high-speed lifts, mountain resorts, and vibrant base villages. Soon, the mountain wasn't just a mountain anymore. It was a playground filled with energy and creative expression. Today, a new generation is taking it to new heights, and it's time the mountain evolved again. Introducing Epic Mix, the key to unlocking a new mountain experience. Epic Mix is an online and mobile app that captures your ski experience, a connection with your friends and family on the mountain. It allows you to share your stories, achievements, and then some. It all starts with your season pass or lift ticket, already enabled with RF technology. The Epic Pass, Summit Pass, Colorado Pass, Heavenly Pass, and Peaks Lift Ticket. They're all smarter than the common paper tape. And once you buy one, you're in the mix. You're automatically part of the Epic Mix experience. When you get to a lift, you can scan just as before with our easy scan process. No need to take your pass out of your pocket. No fumbling with your gloves. Just get on the lift and go. Then start riding. Make some powder tricks. Hit the summit. And find a new favorite run. That's all you need to do. Epic Mix has done the rest. It records each of your lift routes calculates your vertical feed scheme and tallies your epic ski days. And to see it all, you just need to access your account from your computer or mobile phone and your stats, maps, and achievements that tell the story of your epic day or epic season will be waiting for you, even for those under the age of 13 at the Epic Mix Kid site with its own privacy settings and features. But Epic Mix is more than just tracking vertical feet and accounting for ski days. It captures your experience by rewarding your special achievements and epic moments with Epic Mix pins. We've created pins for hundreds of milestones, special adventures, and unique accomplishments for each day, for each season, and for each resort. Each time you accomplish one, you unlock a new pin that's added to your collection. 
If you already use Facebook or Twitter, it's easy to share your epic mix pins and other achievements with friends and family by connecting your accounts with that pins. When you earn a new pin, you don't need to write a tweet or Facebook status update yourself. You can set up your account to automatically update your social networks and instantly show your friends and family members your epic account adventures. We designed Epic Mix Mobile to go where you go. Just download the free Android or iPhone app, or connect to the mobile website, and have access to all your mix information anytime. But it's not just about bragging or broadcasting. Epic Mix Mobile shows you which of your friends are on the map and where. It gives you tools to message your friends and easily set up places to meet. And provides weather forecasts, traffic conditions, mountain updates, snow reports, and more. Skiing and riding have always been social experiences. Sharing stories with friends and family at the end of the great day has been part of the mountains since the very beginning. Now, Epic Mix brings that same tradition into the 21st century. With Epic Mix, the mountain has evolved once again. This season, you'll experience the mountain like never before. So you could see where, you know, that puts a digital layer on top of skiing. It starts to blend the physical and the digital. And I think that's really where things are going. And, and you know, you wonder, okay, what's next? And, and I think what you're going to see is it's not going to be digital and physical. It's just going to be how life is. Um, and, and the one thing I'll say about the Epic Mix, and it's funny, just in the time since we made that, so that was for Vail. So a competing ski uh, uh, mountain came to us after we launched our new agency and said, okay, how can we kick the shit out of this app? You know, make us, make us a, an app that's better than this app. And, and this is really where I think the advancement is going now is we, what we did was we looked at this app and said, well, what does this do? Well, it tracks all the places you ski and then it tells the world with all these badges what you did, you know, and that's okay. It's projecting. It's saying I'm a skier and you look cool to your friends, but it's not really improving your ski experience on the mountain when you're there. It's all the information you get after you're done skiing. So we said, what if there was a way in real time to improve someone's ski experience, to tell them where to go, where the best snow was, where the best kind of thing for the way they ski is, how would you do that? Because you're not going to be standing with a phone. So we created something just recently called, um, um, what is the name of it? Sherpa. Yeah, you would think I know. So it's Sherpa is the name of the app. And Sherpa is like a mountain guide. And so that's why we named it that. But the way it works is you launch the app and we'll show you a short video. You launch the app and you put it away in your pocket because you have gloves on and you don't want to be doing everything while you're skiing. But instead of just tracking all the stuff you're doing and telling people at the end of the day, here's what I did, it's, we've blanketed the mountain with invisible digital markers. So it's geo-targeted technology. So all over the mountain, we took all of their experts and we said, let's put information everywhere. And when you're skiing along and you have the app in your pocket, you have headphones in. And when you go through a marker, it gives you a piece of information. So it could say, go left to get here, go right to get here, go this way for this kind of snow, go this way for that kind of snow. You just want a free set of skis. We can do anything we want with that information. And so they have a dashboard, the people that run the mountain, and they can just blanket the mountain, put, just cover it with all of these digital markers, and it will improve my ski experience. It will let me use the mountain like a local. If you've ever been skiing and you go to a new place, you don't know really where to go, but the locals, they know all the tricks. Well, now everybody knows all the tricks because it happens in real time. And that bundle of functionality using audio, uh, geo-targeting, and the delivery of information in that way was actually patentable. So we, we patented this piece of technology to make this thing. And uh, we'll show you, you know, a quick video on how this works. Wait, stop there, go back. Okay. Meet Sherpa, a hands-free app that gives you real-time inside intelligence across the entire mountain. Entering far east, look for fresh snow near treeline, skiers right. Sherpa tells you what you're near, 
Home Run is opening at noon. Find fresh corduroy on this rolling rumor. Tap to hear more. Where to go? Go left to reach the center village. Stay right to reach the super bee lift. And what to do when you get there? You can get out. Expert terrain. Traverse gears left. Then drop into the right when you find fresh snow. It's locals only insider information. Available for the first time to everyone on the mountain. Stay left for tight trees. Head right for open lines. Sherpa taps into the knowledge of lifelong employees, ski patrol, and local experts, and makes that collective wisdom available to anyone with a mobile device. With insider tips and information, from secret power stashes and blade entrances, to fun, easy runs, and the latest snow conditions, there's even a ski patrol locator function in case you get in trouble. And it's only the beginning, because each season Sherpa will get smarter, with new tools, new features, new secrets for enjoying the mountain. And as one of the first users, you'll be helping it evolve. Sherpa, inside mountain intelligence for all. Experience it at Copper Mountain. Download it from the Apple Store. So for next year, we're actually adding the ability for you to drop pins. Right now, the people that work at Copper, they can drop the pins and go through. But now what we've done is turn it into a true platform, a social, an, an outdoor alpine social networking platform. So if you go and you drop pins and you say, this is my favorite ski run, and when you get to the bottom, this is my favorite place to drink a beer, and I follow you, I can go through all your pins and follow your whole day all by skiing. So, I mean, to me, if you would have told me this, you know, 15 years ago, I wouldn't even know what you were talking about because none of this functionality existed. And now we have this. So on the surface, that's still an ad. You know, Copper's strategy is we're the place where real skiers come to have a true ski experience. But it's also its own social network. It's its own geo-targeted system. It's its own platform. So this is where advertising has come from, from the commercial we showed in the beginning, which is still pretty crazy with the lawyers, all the way to now, you're not just creating an app or a digital utility or a plug-in, you're creating an entire digital platform, but that's working like marketing. You know? So it's been a, a, a crazy ride. And, and there was one thing going back, if you go back, we always said this in advertising, no matter what you're doing in advertising and marketing, it's always better to prove it and not to say it. So if I tell you I'm New Belgium, the beer company that made beer mode, and I'm, I have your interest in mind, we care about the beer drinker, you could tell me that, but if you make this app that lets me disappear from the world and enjoy my beer, you proved it to me. Now I believe you. So digital is inherently more powerful than traditional media because you can prove the thing you're trying to say or be rather than just telling people in a commercial that that's what you are. So I think that's all we have. Yeah, I watched all this happen over time. And what do we think it's going to be? I don't know. You know, I think I imagine something you can't imagine. I don't even know what the fuck that means. I just know that, that whatever digital advertising is going to be, it's nothing any of us can think of right now. It's going to be, you know, it's only accelerating and it's only getting, you know, more advanced. But it's allowing you to do more things, you know. And it's not all bad. You know, some people might say, well, this is invasive and it's advertising going into the rest of my life. But on the other hand, it does offer you things. It offers you new capabilities and it offers you to express who you are. And, and so, and hopefully you can opt for which things you participate in and which things you don't. But at least you're not going to just be inundated by TV messaging. They'll give you something you can use and maybe that thing will make your life better. So, so I think that is it. And you've been great, and I really appreciate uh, uh, you know you taking the time to listen to someone that looks like me. I don't know why you would, and uh, I'm happy to field any questions uh, if you guys have questions about uh, marketing in general, any of it. Um, I'm happy to talk. So, um, if anyone has questions, uh, please let me know. Yes. Uh, well, you're just leaving. <laughs> You know, that hurts. That hurts. <laughs> um, and if you don't have questions, that's okay. You don't have a question. You don't have to ask just to ask. Um, but yeah, happy to answer anything. And uh, uh, even afterwards, if you want to come up and talk, uh, I'll be here. But thank you for your time. Thanks.